Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. If there's ever a problem with the uh, uh, sound or something, let me know, please, because I don't want to listen to myself talk for an hour on every video. So, um, ask yourself this question. How many nations over in the Middle East uh, call themselves Israel? One or many? We read, Behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. God changed Abram's name to Abraham, father of many nations. Not just one little thing over in the Middle East. So, this is going to be the chapter one introductory of Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright by J.H. Allen. So, let's get going. Although it is not generally known, it is nevertheless true that God made two covenants with Abraham, or rather he made one with Abram and another with that same man after his name was changed to Abraham. This na change of name was made that it might harmonize with the new character and the new order of things as they pertain to the covenant man. The first, or Abram, covenant was made with the man was made when the man was 90 years old but the second or abraham covenant was not made until this man was called upon to make one great sacrifice of his life the text of the first of these covenants is as follow and when abram was 90 years old and nine the lord appeared to abram and said unto him I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings, kings, shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after, after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And that's in Genesis 17, chapters 1 through 8. All right, so we see at once that the great feature of this covenant is a multipli multiplicity of seed or children, for a man that hitherto had been childless, and that this multitude of people are to become not one great nation, not simply a plurality of nations, but a large plurality, i.e. many nations. With the great majority of Bible students and with most scholars of biblical thought, the fact that the Lord, while making this covenant, promised Abraham that he should be the father of more than one nation is entirely overlooked. The general trend of the teaching is that of all the people who dwell upon the face of the earth, the Jewish people are distinctively the people 
the one nation only, which is comprised of the seed of Abraham, and that they and they alone are the chosen people of God whose national story makes up the great bulk of Bible history and prophecy. But such cannot be the case. For if God has fulfilled the first promise, which he made to the father of the Jewish people, he has made it possible for the people of some of the other nations of earth to stand side by side with that one and with them to say, we have Abraham to our father. One special important feature of this covenant is that among the multitude of Abrahamic seed, there is to be a royal or kingly line, the posterity of which shall become the rulers of at least some of these nations, which shall or owe, owe their origin to one common father. For the Lord not only promised Abraham that kings should come out of his loins, but when he reiterated the promises of the covenant to Sarai, the barren wife of Abraham, he said, she shall be the mother of nations, kings of people, shall be of her. And so her name was changed to Sarah, i.e. princess, that she might, that she too, that she too might have a name which would be in harmony with her new character, for only a princess may be the mother of kings. Another special feature of this covenant is that there is a land consideration, which involves the land of Canaan in an everlasting bond, not only of ownership, but of possession. Evidently, the everlasting possession of that land by its lawful heirs has not yet begun, for at this writing, it is in the hand, hands of the unspeakable Turk. Um, Bob's note here. I'm deviating off the book. You got to realize this book was written in, um, pro uh, I well, I forget if it, I think it was prior to World War One, and the Ottoman Empire, which was the Ottoman Turks, uh, commonly known, their descendants are known as uh, living in the land of what's called the country of Turkey. Um, they were in control of the land prior to World War I. And it wasn't until, let's see, Turkey, Germany were allies in World War I, and Turkey had to give up uh, the land after World War I. They were compelled. But the Ottoman Empire had been an empire for about 500 years. Yeah, it was a, a large, powerful empire. But the um, advent of modern warfare rendered, rendered them as a, basically like a third world whatever. So... Uh, the uh, perhaps you've heard of the Crusades. Well, that was against the Turks having control of the what they call the Holy Land. So, all right, let me continue reading the book. The end of Bob's commentary. There. One other feature of this covenant is that it is wholly unconditional. That is, the Lord has promised, irrespective of the moral or spiritual character of the people themselves. So to increase the prosperity, uh, posterity of the Abrahamic lineage, that nationality that shall become all that the covenant promises. Centuries after the giving of this covenant, when the Abrahamic posterity were quite numerous and while they were still together in one nation, the Lord made a covenant with them which was conditional. But they broke faith with him and violated the specified conditions. Since it is true that in contracting or conditional covenants that is both a party of the first and a party of the second part, and the law is that when either party breaks the conditions, the other is not held or bound by them. Hence, when the covenant people broke their part of the contract, God was no longer bound and said, They continued not in my covenant, 
and I regarded them not. Thus the covenant was annulled. But in this covenant, which we have under consideration, God has assumed, God has assumed all responsibility, and to the integrity and to his integrity alone we must look for its fulfillment. For while it is true that both God and Abraham are parties to this covenant, we well know who has pledged himself and who will it expresses and whom to expect shall keep his word inviolate and which will be to blame if this covenant goes by default. The second covenant which God made with Abraham was not made until many years after the first and was made at a time when Abraham had just offered his only son who was the first of the promised many as a sacrifice in obedience to the command of him who produced that son by his creative power. From that which was as good as dead and as an expression of faith in the resurrective power of that same covenant making God. It is recorded as follows, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Genesis 22, 16 and 18. And for those of you that never bothered to read the book of Genesis, uh, God called Abraham to sacrifice, to kill Isaac, his firstborn son. And Abraham was willing to do it. But the angel said, don't do this, Abraham. No, no, don't do it. So, all right, let's continue. Before noticing the one great feature of this covenant, we wish to call your attention to some of the minor points. The first of which is that it is also unconditional. By myself have I sworn. Can you imagine um, Bob's note here? Uh, God saying, I swear to God. Yeah. By myself have I sworn. I didn't think about it. What greater way can God swear? By himself. By myself have I sworn is the declaration of the covenant maker. Hence, his covenant can neither be broken nor annulled because as in the first, God alone is the responsible party. Another point is that there is a repetition and confirmation of the multiplicity of children phase of the first covenant to which is added the first detail as to what shall be a national characteristic of Isaac's multiplied seed in their relation to other nations, namely, thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. The Lord usually gives himself two witnesses or doubles his promises or, and prophecies, as in the case of Pharaoh when he had dreamed the same thing twice, and Joseph told him the reason that the dream was doubled to him was because the thing which it signified was of God. So it was with this gate blessing. It was at a time that, after consenting to accompany Abraham's servant and become the wife of Isaac, through whom he must come this great multitude of people, this gate promise, together with that which the pertains to the multiplicity of children, was given to Rebekah. Now remember uh, Bob's note here. Rebekah was the wife of Isaac, who was uh, Abraham's child, his son. So, uh, let's see. Let's keep going here. It came as a parting blessing from her brother, who, it seems, were imbued with the spirit of prophecy. For it is recorded that they blessed her and said, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions. And let thy seed possess the gate of those that hate them. You know, Bob's note here. 
Are there thousands of millions of people in the Middle East that could be Abraham's children? Uh, it doesn't make any sense, does it? That's why the Bible is a closed book to most of the Western world. They're looking in the wrong place for God's blessings. Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those that hate them. But the one great special feature of the second covenant which God made with that one man is most certainly couched in the following words. In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. It will take but little investigation to reveal the fact that this one phase of this last covenant is messianic, but that it pertains especially to but one person, but that the many to whom pertains the first covenant are involved in this together with the one to whom it most especially pertains, and that the principal one of this covenant is involved in the covenant bond of brotherhood, but with the many of that first covenant, no one will deny. We understand that at the time these words were uttered, it would have been impossible to give them the fullness of meaning which the Holy Spirit had given them as interpreted in the New Testament, for it was under the illumination given to the Apostle Paul that their full import bursts upon us. It was when contrasting the law covenant, the one which was annulled, with this only son covenant that Paul is careful to say, now to Abraham were the promises made even for his seed. He does not say, and to the seeds as concerning many, but as concerning one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. We have here given the best translation for clearness that the text will allow. In it, the apostle makes no attempt to give an exact Old Testament quotation, but bases his argument on the strength of the subject, noun being in the singular number. The subject with which he is dealing is the blessing that shall come upon all the Gentile nations through Abraham's sacrificed son, the one seed who also was the only son of his divine father, just as Isaac, the type, was the only son of his father when he was offered in sacrifice. It is not only the words, but also the circumstances connected with the giving of these promises which are prophetic. God had said to Abraham that the many nations which he had formerly promised him should come through Isaac, his only son. But afterward, called upon him to sacrifice that son, who was the only one through whom that promise could be fulfilled. But Abraham knew that God had accomplished that which was equal to a creation, when through him and Sarah, who were both as good as dead, Isaac had been produced. So being strong in faith, he offered him up according that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Bob's note here. Uh, Isaac was not the firstborn son of Abraham. He had another son before that, that he named Ishmael from the Egyptian woman, Hagar but not through Sarah. Sarah was to have the promised seed, not Hagar. So you've got nations through Ishmael, which I believe are the Arabic nations, but they were rejected as the promised covenant seed. All right, let's continue. Could any analogy be more complete? A son of promise, an only son, from whom so much is expected, sacrificed and accounted den, dead, accounted dead, then in symbol raised from the dead. And the two special reasons for this test being, on the one hand, 
an encouragement to faith, on, and on the other, that the Son might live to fulfill his God-ordained destiny. The prototype of this is another Son of Promise, and only Son from whom so much, so very much is promised and expected, sacrificed on the dead tree, uh, on the tree dead. But that the two witnesses, the word and the symbol of the promiser, might not fail, the Divine Father, who gave back that other only son raises from the dead his only son that he also might become the author and finisher of our faith that he too might live and become all that was promised and expected of him and thus fulfill his glorious destiny we can ask no more for both the lesser and the greater son the type and prototype are as concerning the flesh sons of abraham Throughout the world, it is generally known, and throughout Christendom, it is generally known that the seed to whom the promise was made did come, but it is not universally known nor acknowledged through Christendom that the many peoples are included in the same covenant with this one seed, without whom the entire structure of Christianity must fail. I'm sorry, must fall. And that every argument for the, uh, for the Christ from the covenant standpoint, must stand the crucial test of a numerous prosperity from the loins of Abraham or go down. And yet it is so. True, the covenant with the people failed. True, the people sinned and violated their obligations. True, the law was added because of their transgressions to bridge over till the one seed should come to whom the promise was made. But the argument in favor of the Messianic Covenant against all this, that the covenant which was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. How could it? We, sirs, believe that it could not. All Christendom believes that it could not. And if it could not, neither can the promise concerning a multiplicity of children for Abraham be annulled. For with this same messianic promise, there is a repetition of the metaphor of many seeds as the stars of heaven and as the sands of the seashore, together with the gate blessings. So we can just as reasonably expect that Christ could or would have failed as to expect that the gate, the sand, and the star promises shall have gone by default. But at this late day in the history of the world, with the divine light of prophecy shining upon well-known facts, which once were only the subjects of prophetic utterances, but are now the recorded facts of authentic history, we can say with a confidence, which is supported by the eternal spirit, that neither has have failed that neither have failed. That's right, neither have failed. Elsewhere, when the same apostle was making an effort to encourage the faith of believers in the faithfulness of God, he gives a word for word quotation from the same covenant promise saying, when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself saying, surely blessing I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply thee. This quotation, as you see, pertains to the multiplicity of seed and not to the messianic phase of the second covenant. But it proves to us that each individual feature of that covenant stands on the same secure foundation and is just as secure of fulfillment and is just as sure of fulfillment as the other. For underneath every promise of that covenant, there are two immutable things, God and his oath. So we are safe in saying that God has made two unconditional covenants with Abraham, and that if he has been true to those covenants, then there are many nations in existence on this earth today, the people of which must have descended from Abraham and Sarah, and that these nations are in possession of the gates or entrances of their national enemies, unless it be that the time 
has not yet come for those promises to materialize. The facts in either case are revealed, and as we proceed, we shall see which of these is true. But thus far, it is evident that one of the covenants is messianic, and that the other is multitudinous, that each is contained in the other, that in them there is no contracting party of the second part, and that both alike do stand on the integrity of God. These are the days of skeptical indifferencism on the one hand, and of rampant infidelity on the other, of narrow sectarianism, worldly churchianity, and the blatant headlines, oh, headliness of higher criticism. Days when Endorism is called spiritualism, when Buddhism is sanctified by the name of theo Theosophia, i.e. divine wisdom, and when pure faith and uh, true spirituality are termed fanaticism. You know, people, uh, Bob's note here, this is a hundred years ago. Uh, and higher criticism, those were those that were spiritual. Uh, saying, oh, the Bible couldn't possibly be true, and they have, would have all kinds of arguments, and saying that this book doesn't belong in the Bible, and this one doesn't belong. You know, it's the same thing today, but this is when all this stuff started happening. And this is when Charles Darwin and all his stuff started coming, uh, evolution started coming out of the closet. Um. And if you don't know what Endorism, um, Saul and the Witch of Endor, yeah. Yeah, if any of you remember uh, the, the TV show Bewitched, uh, Samantha, the, the mother witch, had a, her mother was named Endora. Just a coincidence, right? Yeah. Um, let's see. All right, let's keep reading. Yeah, and if you actually believe the Bible, you're called a fanatic, which... Thank you. Yeah, I have. Let's keep reading. Then surely in such days as these, all who believe that the promises of God are never broken will be helped and encouraged when proof full and abundant shall be, shall be given that not only uh, the promise concerning the many nations, but all the predictions of Moses and the prophets as they pertain either to the Christ or to the many nationed people have been our being or on the strength of that which has been that and that which is now shall yet be fulfilled and that everybody is the end of chapter one of judah's scepter and joseph's birthright by j h allen and we're going to continue in chapter two and this was just the introductory um all blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.